So before we proceed with the you know, proceedings of the day, we will have a one minute silence in honor of the memory of the Rohingya victims of Myanmar's genocide. Ladies and gentlemen, can you please stand up and, you know, for, for a minute. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Some of us had the misfortune to see the victims, the survivors of genocide. Many of you haven't met them yet. We don't, we don't know what they endure. So in order to set the context, the gruesome reality, you know, that the Rohingya people face in their homeland, we decided that we will have about a 10-minute video, you know, the, the, the atrocities that have been committed. And these videos were essential documents that were presented before the Permanent People's Tribunal held in, uh, in, in Kuala Lumpur, Permanent People's Tri Tribunal on State Crimes of Myanmar. And this is something the tribunal took into cognizance. This is one genocide that has been, you know, massively documented. There, there are evidence, you know, even the fleeing refugees also took, you know, with their mobile phone, uh, they, they, they took images, what were, was, was happening. So there is no doubt that what is happening is to be true. And they have been validated by forensic, you know, t tests and whatever we call it, that the technological test that stood the t those tests. So it is in this context, without furthering it, may I request my col uh, colleague to switch on. I'm afraid there is, uh, yeah, yeah, it's just 10 minutes. Yeah. These people have just crossed the border. They're in no man's land. They've been driven from their homes in Myanmar. Now they're waiting for permission to enter Bangladesh. The Rohingya are a people that neither country wants. And what happened in your village? <laughs> They just burnt our houses. These are some of the survivors. They're hungry, they're sick, and they're scared. Across the river, there's a deliberate campaign of terror going on. A campaign from which no one is safe. Well, we don't know how many people have been killed, but we do have some idea of how many have been burnt and chased out of their homes. These are just a tiny fraction of the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who have fled. In our investigation, we're going to focus on the events of one day, of one massacre in one village. And its name 
is Tula Tony. Since August, more than 600,000 people have sought refuge in the camps in Bangladesh. People who brought little with them but the nightmarish memories of their experiences at the hands of the Burmese military. We've come here to find survivors of the Tulatoli massacre. We've spoken to six of them. We've cross-referenced their testimony with video evidence. Absolutely horrific pictures. With maps of the local area, as well as with interviews collected by human rights organizations. What emerges is a picture of systematic violence. Violence that has been described as a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. Using a satellite photograph of the area, a Rohingya elder showed me how the massacre unfolded. The village of Tulatoli consists of a number of settlements surrounded on three sides by the meandering flow of a river. In previous days, soldiers had set fire to other villages on the opposite bank. That Wednesday morning, the 30th of August, they crossed into Tulatoli. There was panic. Everyone mentions the river. With the soldiers advancing from the northwest, and a police post to the south. Many of the villagers ran east. They ended up on the riverbank. They were trapped. And you yourself were on the other side of the river. Anura showed us where she and others swam across the river, at a point downstream where it was narrow enough to cross. They used banana trees and plastic canisters as life rafts. Did, did you see this with your own eyes? From a hill on the opposite bank, they watched the horror unfold. The horrific scenes she witnessed still give her nightmares. Anura watched the bodies of her neighbor's children wash up on the riverbank. The scene was filmed by another villager. 
The children's names were Rashida, five years old, Kushida, three, and Zahida, who was 11 months. Anora Begum, her husband and her four children all managed to escape with their lives. Mohammed Suleiman was not so fortunate. He and his youngest daughter Shahida survived, but three of her sisters were killed and so was their mother. <laughs> the violence began five days before the massacre at Tula Toli, on the 25th of August, when members of a Rohingya militant group attacked a number of police posts inside Myanmar, killing 12. In response, the Burmese military began what they call clearance operations. Boats filled with refugees have been coming ever since. It's two months since the terrible incidents that we've been looking at. And these people are saying that it's still going on. Some have accused the Burmese government of using the attacks by the militants as a pretext for a vicious and indiscriminate crackdown against civilians. The Bangladeshi authorities monitor what goes on on the other side of the border. And I've been told that from the beginning of August, so about three weeks, before the violence started, they noticed an increase in military activity on the Myanmar side. Now, if that's true, that would suggest an element of preparation for the violence that followed. And this is a suggestion that we've heard corroborated by some of the witnesses we've spoken to as well. context has been set. I'll be very brief with my introductory statement. You know, international pressure is building, you know, to rise, I mean, it is, it is for the world to rise up to the occasion. Unfortunately, what we see that states are, that are mandated to ensure security and peace in the world are being guided by selfish economic interests, that too promoted by corporate capital and you know, they have kept the UN system uh, as hostage. We see the key UN personnel, they are in sync with the reality. The UN Secretary General, the UN Special Rapporteur, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, but United, UN Security Council consists of you know, member states. They have been rather sort of inept. But inaction by the UN does not mean it's the end of the world. It throws fresh challenges. It's also curious to, I mean, it, it, it throws fresh, fresh challenges. It is in, in such an international context, pressure has to be built on the governments. And we, the people, the masses, who have built, we, we have to build up that pressure. The governments are guided by narrow, myopic interests. It is the civil society who aspire for better world that has to get its act together and force the state, states to change their course. This has been done in the past, stopping the war in Vietnam, ending the apartheid regime in South Africa. You know, so the, there are a lot of good examples. It might have taken time, but we have succeeded. Government does diplomacy, state to state level. Many issues, you know, government has to handle diplomatically. We understand that, you know. But at the same time, we also acknowledge and we must highlight that free thinking is hallmark of civil society. In that respect, civil society can not, can, can not only dig deep into the 